It's going to be a couple minutes later. Um, 
In 2009, State Street Fruit Store expansion was given a five-year, 5% five TIF. In 2005, the, new, the Northampton Airport was given a five-year, 5% five TIF. In 2008, Wright Architectural Millwork in the Industrial Park was given a similar five-year, 5% five TIF. 2005, the Daily Hampshire Gazette was given a five-year TIF. It was 50% in year one and two, 25% in year three, and 5% in year four and five. And in 2005, Big Y Supermarket received a 15-year uh, TIF that began at 5% and then worked its way down to 1% in the final years of that agreement. Um, so uh, that that's kind of the landscape. So 5% has kind of been like pretty much what we had always used as our standard TIF to get people into the state tax program. Um, so I that's sort of where I where I tried to stick to is the 5%. So you'll see the proposal that I have before you is 25%. But what we've done is because half of the units at this, at this project are, um, are affordable, uh, we, uh, we decided to do a separate proposal, the city and Christopher Heights, to the Community Preservation Committee to seek funding for CPC funding to support the affordable units. At, at, on this particular project. Um, and, and the idea would be that, I, just give you the quick overview, which is a 25% TIF, but 20% of it would be underwritten by CPC money. Um, so in effect, we'd be giving a 5% TIF. So they received a, the unanimous endorsement of the housing partnership who thought this was a great project that filled the need in Northampton for affordable assisted living, which is something we don't have a lot of. Um, we went to the CPC last week, and um, the request to the CPC, uh, again, um, was, uh, it was $120,000 was the request. Um, and it, uh, I just want to read you a quick summary of that. Um, let's see, and, and, and they, they recognized the fact that it would be creating 17 units that would be at 30% of the adjusted median income, 26 units at 60% of the adjusted um, median income, and 40 units that would be um, 85 plus or minus percent of the adjusted median income. And then the other interesting thing that came out of that was um, the project uh, is requesting 120,000 in CPA funds, which will result in affordability restrictions on 43 assisted living units for a CPA unit cost of $2,800, so that's $2,800 per unit. This would be the lowest per unit cost of any CPA affordable housing project to date, and would result in more new affordable units than the CPA has created since it was passed. So they've done 39 units total to date, um, and, uh, and that those have totaled 1.145 million to create those 39 units. This would create, um, this would create uh, you know, 43 units. So what I have is a quick little spreadsheet which I'll give you, which just shows you kind of the mathematics behind what we've come up with. Um, and, uh, and so you've got, you'll see we, we use the new 1426 tax rate. Um, just to illustrate it, the actual value of the, the estimated property value is 2.8 million. That's a number that's been checked and arrived at by our assessors. Um, and and they, they treat this as essentially, it's, they treat it almost as an apartment building, and they use an income approach to look at the size of the apartments and what they'll generate. And, and it actually is, it's, it's half, actually, the value because of the affordable units. Um, so the 2.8 number is, if it, were, if it were a non, if it were just a market rate, you would think it would be a larger tax bill, but this is what it will come out to, 2.8 million. So you'll see that their annual taxes on that would be 39,928. Um, the 15 year um, affordable housing discount on the TIF, uh, you'll see comes to you know, the 9,982. The city's share of that, you see over, we've broken down the 5% and the 20%. So the 5% uh, would represent you know, $1,996 a year over those five years. The 20%, you can see what that adds up to, and the cumulative effect is 119,784. And so the CPA, and, and it's a little bit of a balancing act because the CPA has made their award contingent upon um, 
you know, a, that this will be this will be to um, in conjunction with the TIF, and the CPC passed it by five to one. The, their biggest question was the TIF because they had never done an arrangement like this before, um, and they were just like, well, we usually just give money right to people. Um, Mr. Ohanian came, and their their big issue is really they they have kind of a uh, they have to, as part of the tax credits they've applied for, um, they have to really show, at least they have to show a, like a 15 year pro forma of their operating expenses and, and all the other things that go into running the facility. I mean, it's, it's, in, it's the, the big costs are obviously the construction and all that, but then the key for them is to, is to really have stable operating costs every 15 years. That's why they're more interested in a TIF as opposed to just give us 120,000 up front. Um, and again, we, we went around and around about that, but that's kind of what they wanted. Um, they are gonna create 40 jobs. Um, this is part of a, an already established economic opportunity area that we already established, which is one of the requirements for the TIF. And it'll be a local only TIF. It's not gonna be a TIF that they're gonna get other state tax incentives for. It's clearly a local only TIF. Um, but I believe strongly in the, in the project in that it's been part of the master plan for Village Hill from the onset to create, a, a, to create assisted living. It's also um, a good project and, it's a, and from the CPC and the, and the housing partnership uh, perspective, it's really fulfilling a, a type of affordable housing that we don't have currently in the city. Um, and so, you know, that's my reason for advocating for it. Um, so that's what I've come up with. It, so it's it's a 25% TIF, but with an asterisk because we're we found another funding source to backfill, and yeah, you know, obviously, and, and that's what we've come up with. So I will answer any questions that you have. I don't know if you said that. But I was trying to read these the numbers here. This is just scrivener error on the, yeah, the years. I you're right. Uh, where, what happened? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. We reset it at the 21. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, that was just okay. something. Yeah. I didn't apologize. Yeah. My bad. Other questions? The, now, so the, the CPA is going to put the seventy-nine or, or eight thousand dollars in every single year. Well, what's going to happen is um, that part of it we haven't figured out exactly how we want to do it. It can certainly be dispersed over fifteen years, or one of the. I mean, we we haven't quite figured out how that will work. Um, but the money it. I kind of I kind of equate it to when we bought um, open space and there's tax title on the property and we buy a piece of land that has an outstanding tax title and the money you know satisfies the, the tax debt basically and the city gets the land we're kind of moving one the money from one you know pocket to another pocket so we haven't figured out the mechanics but we could certainly you know they'll probably Disperse, they could disperse the money all at once, or they could disperse it over 15 years. It, it's, I mean, it's not like it's a large enough number to bond for or anything like that. They may just disperse it to the city. We'll put it in a um, in a special line item, and then every year it can just flow to the general fund to, to offset the the, top, the, la the loss of tax revenue. Okay, so just to be clear, the city. Will just not receive this 1996. That would be left with less than the tax bill. Is that what you're That's correct. Yeah. It, now keep in mind. I mean, this is a. I'm doing kind of a static projection using a tax rate for today and a value for today. But that's just that's the only thing we can do for this exercise. Obviously, their tax bill that their their that 1426 could go down. It could go up. The value could change. I mean, th those are. But I'm just trying to project roughly yep. what it would be to play it out. Um, so that's just another another asterisk. You know, there. I, I, I just wonder how this will play out in the court of public opinion as we go forward, which we're charged with trying to find a way to pay for storm. I can just, I can hear that. Yep. Um, and, 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 I, and, I, and that's definitely, I know any, I know any talk of tax incentives or, or, or um, you know, it, it, clearly that's going to be an issue. I, I guess the way I look at it is this is a piece of property that's currently not on the tax rolls. This is a this is a property that's not on the tax rolls, and um, and 
we can say, you know, if this project doesn't happen, maybe another project will come along, maybe it won't. Um, maybe, you know, from the housing partnerships perspective, they would be upset if, you know, probably another, just another regular market rate housing unit would be built there, condos, homes, whatever, but that wouldn't be good for them because it's not the affordable, you know, that wouldn't help provide affordable housing. Um, but so, so the, 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 the new growth on the tax rolls that this project will create is, is growth that's not there right now. So we're going to still, re we're going to realize 75% of the new growth on the tax revenue, but not the full 100%. Well, actually, won't you, won't you re realize 95%? It's just that some of that's coming from the CBA. Well, instead. So it is, as I understand it, you, you, you still get, the city will still get 38000 instead of thirty nine nine. It will just, some of it will be coming from CPA. Well, the way we've structured it, though, is at least the way it's proposed is they will get a 25% exemption on their tax. Bill. They will. They will. They'll pay less. Yes. But the city. But then the city will, will be getting this extra CPA. supplemental in, right. in to so, offset 20% so of it. The city's only out. Is, is out the $1,900 the, the $1, a year for the 15, well, obviously for at least year one, and then that could change for the other years. Um, so that is, yeah, I mean, anytime we do a TIF, you know, whether it's for State Street or Gazette or whatever, you're, you're taking a certain amount of new growth off the tax rolls, but the theory is you're trying to encourage new growth, and you're trying to, you're, and you're also, you have a guarantee of job creation. If the jobs aren't created, you can withhold that TIF and they have to pay it back. Um, so you're creating jobs, you're adding to the <coughs> tax base, um, and you're providing a little bit of uh, you know, financial assistance. Um, I will say that uh, DHCD, um, the Department of Community Housing, um, they uh, did a site visit and they're, they're currently reviewing the low income the low-income tax credit application of Christopher Heights, and one of the things they look at is community support, and they were they were impressed at the fact that most of these projects they've done have had a TIF, which is fine, but they view the TIF and the CPC as as very favorable because it you know because it shows a true commitment to affordable housing, which is what their agency is all about. So, yeah. do you have a sense of? You said this was this was um, part of the master plan. I know the TIF is not part of the master plan. Oh no no no! I meant the I meant assisted project. living has always been. There's always been a, an assisted living facility envisioned for Village Hill. It's always been carved out as something, and for years we've tried to to gain interest. But as you know, there's already other existing facilities, and there hasn't been a big demand. I think what changes it is this affordable component. Um, Again, the, the, for housing, in the court of public opinion, I got a call from a constituent of mine today about how much his taxes have gone up in, mm -hmm. in this particular year, in water and sewer. So um, do you have a sense of whether they're, will they just can this project without the TIF or do you think they'll stay? Uh, I, I, I know that's a pretty, it's a loaded question. It's a loaded it's question. Asking. It's a loaded <laughs> question, I, and I, I really couldn't speculate on it. I, all I can say is that they have, and um, you know, this is a complicated project. Uh, Bill Breitbart, who's on the CPC, is like, a, this is what he does. He does housing finance, and he was amazed at the complexity of the project because they, they are melding not only um, health care, but they're melding services and they're accessing different programs to pay for it. And, and, it's a, and so they're, uh, you know, again, I don't know whether they would say, that's it, we're not going to do it without a tip. I don't know. All I said, my commitment to them was I would bring it forward. Um, when I talked to you before, I got the message, tip, the tip is too large that they're thinking of. And so this is my way of trying to get it down to what's been more standard for Northampton, the 5%. So, I just want to say I think this is a great arrangement. I want to just applaud the creative management, frankly. I, I'm, it is a little bummer to me that the number 25 has to appear anywhere um, in terms of the, what we're giving as a TIF, but if we can figure out how to have that massive asterisk next to it as we go through um, and explain that, in fact, it's a de facto 5% TIF, then if we address that sort of precedent piece, um, and I realize it's not new precedent, but just th this particular instance, then I just think it's a win-win. I mean, it just seems like a fabulous partnership. So 
So thank you for making And I would say that we are, my goal would be because the two are, I mean, the, the, the CPC is dependent on the TIF and the TIF is dependent on the CPC award. I, my plan would be to bring them both to the city council the same right, night. So right. they would so be the together. The recording of it at minimum. It would be out there. Yeah, because yeah. really the CPC, um, they, they passed a resolution which clearly says that it's, um, that it's, you know, this was, this is to partially, the language says, um, and it says that 120,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act for the City of Northampton for the Christopher Heights Assisted Living Project for creation of 43 affordable assisted livings. The grantee meets the conditions approved by the CPC, the Mayor and City Council, and that CPA funds will be used to capitalize a portion of a 15 year tax increment financing tax abatement project for the city. So um, if that in fact is not what happens, then I'll go back to square one and we'll go back to the CPC or go back to the drawing board. But uh, the sense and answer to Jean's question is that they probably wouldn't uh, back away for uh, that relatively small amount of dollars on a budget of this size and given the complexity and thoroughness of the preparation mm -hmm. and the architectural drawings and all the stuff that we saw at the last meeting. Um, on the other hand, uh, for the city to send, spend 1900 bucks a year to get that kind of goodwill for something that's this significant, I think is actually a pretty cheap price. Uh, I want to also thank you, Mr. Mayor, for this this, this creative um, solution, but I, I do have a lot of reservations, actually, about it. Um, the, the one that, that bothers me the most is that I think, uh, I, I'm not sure who's going to be making up the difference when, we, when the city council, as it does almost every year, raises the tax rate uh, by raising the base by two and a half percent. Um, now we could we can speculate about where the property value might be. The property value might stay the same, property value might go down or what have you, but um, if it stays the same, then it's likely that the that they'll that the, this project, the, this the building, the eventual building will be paying more taxes as the years go on. Uh, so you know, this really isn't in Compton dollars. I know it's very difficult to project yeah, what that's going to be. I'm all, yeah, I was only doing this for illustration purposes. So, so but, then, but then the issue is, where does the shortfall come from? Where is the shortfall made up? Because we, it's very likely there will be, uh, that, that the tax, that the, that the tax that, uh, the, the Christopher Heights project is asked to pay in 20, in, in 2027 is larger than $40,000, it's very likely. So if that's the case, the 25% discount is the true 25% discount. The city will lose you know, more than $2,000, that's that's okay, that's the, that's the nature of the, the percent discount. But where does the CPA share come from? Does the CPA put in more to make up for the 20% or does the CPA giving uh, non-inflated dollars, 7,986, uh, do they, is that the, is that a fixed dollar? Is there, they're giving a fixed dollar. So this is, a, the it really is coming from the city. Oh, it would be definitely, and, and you know, frankly, the, the, you know, if you think about it, I thought, I wasn't sure where you were going with this. Quite go where I thought you were going, but the but you know well, let's go there too. When you give a tip, you you are shifting the tax burden to that twenty for that twenty five percent to all the other taxpayers. I mean that's just the nature of it. I mean my argument would be that 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 even that there's still seventy five percent new growth there that's going to be part of the tax base that wouldn't be there without the project. I mean that's always the argument, um, right? Because right now it's a non mass development pays no property taxes because that's their governmental agency. So it's not generating any revenue. Um, right, we're, we're shifting it from the, the, the tax base to the CPA fund, basically. There's no doubt about it. Uh, yeah. but, but that's, that's um, like we do is we acquire open space. Yeah. And we acquire open space and we, we, we take money off the tax roll. We use tax dollars to take money off the tax rolls. Right, right, so that's, that's, that's always, it's yeah. always a, a different yeah. uh, bucket, yep. uh, conceptually. Uh, and and uh, I, I don't have I don't object to paying for uh, for using CPA funds to pay for these affordable uh, to help subsidize these affordable units. But I do object maybe to the um, I think.
think I think what I object to is the 25 percent. I think I'd prefer to see the city give uh, a nice um, $10,000 discount in the first year and uh, and whatever that percent is, uh, and then have it decline so that we can possibly have have the this uh, this do these dollars look more more realistic because what I how, this is how I see it. I see the first year being 5% TIF that the city grants, 20% 20, 20 CPA. And then as time goes on, it growing to 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12%, 13% from the city side, and even less and less from the CPA. That's how I see that happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, I, I, I don't, uh, I prefer that that didn't happen. I prefer it, the, the percent to decrease roughly in line with what we could project to be the increases in the tax base. I, I have a question to follow up to that, if I could. Was there any suggestion on just taking, I think this is in line with what you're saying, just said, let's just give them $150,000. I mean, it's an extreme well, of what you're saying. Why don't we just give them an incentive to come and say, here's $150,000, that's the one twenty and, and the thirty the city was putting in. Is that a possibility of doing that? Was it brought up at all? Um, I can say that at the CPC meeting, that was one of the hangups because people couldn't, their, you know, Christopher Heights, their preference was for the TIF. And I don't know if that's because that's what their model has been, that's been the business model, I don't know. Because the CPC was like, why don't you just take the 120 and put it in a bank account? And like, and, and when your tax bill comes every year, take a little bit out. I mean, that, that's sort of the level of the discussion. Um, but they, uh, you know, I don't know if it's something to do with their balance sheet and what they show as income to the project. You know, I, I don't know any of that part of it. I mean, I did present to them one other option was to say, okay, the 120,000, what if we did it as a five year? And, and, and the window was, you know, it, then it would be a much larger TIF but we over the first five the years. We could much better. Um, we could control the projections much, much better. You could theoretically do that, although even then I can't predict for you what the tax rate will be next year or the year after. So we did we did play out that five year scenario, saying big tip over five years or a smaller one over fifteen years. They again, their issue is this: this fifteen years is like a magic window with the DHCD and and their whole pro forma for fifteen years. So that's why they preferred the longer, slower. And you're right; the longer it is, the, the more risk there is on our side that, that it's going to be, you know, we'll lose out. Although I would argue, also argue that it's possible, you know, if things change, they, they, you know, we could still, it could still come in at, at close to the 120. But again, it's, it's, um, uh, your point is well taken. Yes. But it's worth remembering that the only, if there's a, a inflation to value of the property, their taxes go up, the total tax goes up as well. So yes, the, the dollars that the city chips in go up, but the dollars they're chipping in goes up as, as well. So the revenue to the city continues to increase. Right. They, the net it, it's the same. It's the same as any. I mean, same as any tip, right? It's five percent or eighty percent. Their value goes up. They pay more. We we would we would collect more, but we don't. That's the, that's the argument over tax breaks, right? That would be the same as any taxpayer of the city. That's right. One other question: I, Is it possible to take the uh, CPA money? We're saying we, well, we're just going to give the eight thousand a year and put that into some account that's producing uh, some kind of interest on that. And then yeah, well, we, we I mean, we will we would keep it in an account, but it wouldn't be. Yeah, you know, it's not going to exactly. It's not going to produce any big interest in for the kind of account we would keep it in. So, I mean, uh, a new. We'll make sure this time. A new one. I just want to make sure we're not going to get redundant on this. Oh, on. no. Um, so this, this is the first time that we've used CPA for a is that correct? This would be, well, yeah, th that, that is definitely true. This would be the first time we'd be trying to kind of do the two things parallel. Yeah. Um, which is also different for the CPC. That's not something they've ever done before. So it was a little bit outside the box. That's definitely sure, for sure. And again, I was trying to give it, satisfy a TIF, but also come up with funding to support the affordable housing unit, so. I don't, I don't know if I want to support the C, uh, taking money from the CPA to support a TIF. It just, it just rubs me wrong. It's, it, no matter how you spell this taxpayer dollars, no matter how you look at it, uh, it might be in a, a different bucket, but it still comes on your tax bill, it's still taxpayer dollars. Like, I, I just, I wonder just how the public will will perceive this. Um, if it was just a five percent straight tip, we would have the nineteen hundred dollars or whatever the five.
I just, it just, I, I guess I haven't really absorbed it yet, but go ahead. Uh, uh, oh, I, um, I respectfully disagree. I, I think it's a very creative way, and I think it's a good way to uh, find, to, to finance um, a, essentially a private development that's doing affordable housing. I think that's a, a good way to do it through, through that. Um, as I said, I'm just going to reiterate what I said. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with the length. I'm going to make sure we don't repeat ourselves in yeah, no, this particular case. So I just, I just wanted to. So I guess what I what I what I, I guess I guess the guidance I need from you is, and I you know the way the process the process we've established in the city is the typically the the mayor brings forward a recommendation to the city council for a TIF. Um, the tradition has been to come through the EDLU committee first, get a endorsement or a co recommendation, yes. and then the order goes forward. Um, so. So we have, I, so we have an option to, to recommend, not recommend, or to bring it forward without any recommendation. Well, not, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't bring it forward without your recommendation. Um, so if there's not a rec, if, uh, so if the sense is that there's not a support for recommending this proposal, I would, it would be good to get that on the record just so we know that, and then, then I can uh, go back to them or, um, and then we'll have to go back. Or if there's another TIF proposal people would feel comfortable supporting, I can you can you can discuss and, and vote on that, and I can um, and I can bring that okay. either forward or not forward. So I, I I'm not I, I I don't know whether there's some procedural rule that prevents us going in front of the main ca the, the council with uh, with our mixed views here because I, to me I feel like I want the benefit of I, I personally feel comfortable with this and I recognize the concerns being raised I think they're valid and I feel on balance um, okay um, and I'm I just I think I just I appreciate the the like I said before the creativity and the, the trying to figure out how to make this work and I would like to support it and I would like to, if there's not enough support here for a rec blanket recommendation, then I'd want count larger council input. I'd be, uh, I don't know what your timeline is. So, I mean, if, if I would love to see something that is sh a shorter period, uh, and, and that doesn't, you know, it could be a larger tip. I mean, obviously the percents, the percent will have to go up if we're willing to offer this much, or it could be a larger, in the, for the first few years and smaller afterwards for the next ten or something like that. Yeah, um, that's what my personal and I'm and um, I, know, I know there hasn't been a motion, but I would I would not recommend this. Okay. And, but I also I agree with Councilor Schwartz. I don't think since you, since the council didn't refer refer to us, I think you could just go straight to the council. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of I wouldn't like it, but I think you could just. Well, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to do is just follow the procedure that we've used in the past. I mean, it's not written in stone. It's not. I mean, it is required under state law that the city council approve a resolution. I think the the way it's worked in the past is that in, through this in this negotiation period, the mayor has tried to involve the Edlu committee, knowing that anything would get referred to them. So it's you know so. Um, because it doesn't, I typically, it doesn't go, it doesn't, these things don't get referred anywhere. They don't go to ordinance committee or anything like that. It's, it's just, and the fact that it comes with Edlu, then it just gets voted on as a resolution. So, um, so I couldn't, I could introduce it and have it referred back to you, but then I don't think that saves any time. I'd rather yeah. have your final. No, I, I feel like there are five other counselors that are part of the council that uh, before, honestly, before use and CPA and the developers spend more time on this, I would want to know whether what the balance of the council feels. Because it is a it's a use of time, one way or the other, right? It's either it's either time on the front end or I mean pre our council meeting or post our council meeting, but to me it feels like there was enough work done here to have it go in front of the nine members of the council to then reject or or accept. Sure. I can get, make a statement at the end of this debate I'd like to do that now, which is that I, I agree with Councilor Schwartz. I'd like to move it forward without a recommendation. But part of it is, uh, having served on this committee for a whole five terms, I think that I've, and, and 
knowing the mayor well and knowing C the, way, the work the CPA does and the thoroughness of those of both the mayor and the CPA. And I imagine they worked hard to get the best thing they could get to keep this project going. So I would like um, now if I also agree with the you know the criticisms both of you have. And if, for example, you could go back before you bring it to the city council and I think front load it the way Councilor Freeman Daniels was saying, I would be even happier with this. But um, I would suggest we move this forward timeline, see if you can go back and renegotiate. But if you can't, I'd suggest you come before the whole council. Well, my problem is that I have, um, typically the way this works is there's kind of like a standard like language for the order that these things always have in them that you know have to say that it meets the requirements of CMR. So there's an order, whereas the proposed Grantham Group Assisted Living Project meets the requirements of 402 CMR, whereas the proposed Grantham Group Assisted Living Project um, you know, is part of the Village Hill Hospital Economic Opportunity Area. Will not, it, there's standard language that we put in all of our tips. And then it says ordered that the City Council approves the Grantham Group Assisted Living Project as a certified project within the Village and Hospital Hill Economic Opportunity Area and grants tax increment financing plan for a period of 15 years with a 25% TIF exemption on the new growth. Uh, and then it goes on more standard language about executing the contract. So I, you know, I would, I still couldn't put something on the council agenda that said it was recommended by you that didn't have some specific we're not, recommendation. We're, we're, we're not recommending. Okay. What you're saying is we, you, we you move it forward without right. a recommendation. Are you saying that you'd recommend it? Are you saying that you would put it on the council agenda with your recommendation? I would do that, but the question would be, you uh, can't do that. No, I can certainly do it, but then the, would the council then say, well, we want to refer this to Edmund no, to no, get no, their recommendation? No, 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 we're here to say no. Uh, I mean, we're if you're just, authorizing, if you're going to authorize are, to have me What we are saying is we are moving it forward. Uh, what I would suggest is we move forward, and I don't know if this would be asked, we move forward without a recommendation. That allows you the leeway. We're, we're giving you a charge to say, look, well, you're not making a recommendation on something. So I, got, I, got, yeah. I, I understand yeah. what's going on. We can't, we can't recommend uh, okay. it to council without recommendation, right? And because it wasn't referred to us, we can't. I mean, what I would put, I would so send an order for it that would say upon the recommendation so, of the so mayor and the no non-recommendation of Ed Lou or something, how I would do that. So we have no vote one way or another that if it hasn't already been recommended to us. Is that what you're saying? Right. Pretty much. Well, unless, well, unless no, you I mean, either, we either sponsor it or we, or we, we, we I mean, the other, I mean, part of this is also, this is also an artifact of the old Edlu structure, which yeah. was you had a committee that was chaired by the mayor and had her economic development staffer and the council, and they were kind of work. So that's not, that doesn't exist anymore. So, can I, yes. can I make a suggestion that yes. you bring it before the council, and mm -hmm. the council may refer here? Okay. And the council okay. may not, but yes. at least you bring it before the council. Okay. And, 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 it, and I, I've taken your feedback, um, and I can go. I can go back and try to figure out do some your, approach to it. Do your right? best. Which and is it doesn't. It, and it, it's on. It's on the timeline that you you can anticipate. Uh, yeah. If if you feel as though it needs to be at the next council meeting, then you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. President. I'm not I'm worried about that. I don't think it has to be at the next council meeting. So the CPC is active, but they they're not in a rush to be on you. It doesn't have to go to the agenda. Also, if you do bring it up to the next council meeting and they refer it here, then we can move it forward without any recommendation. Right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we'll vote on that. I we'll suppose that. Okay. Yeah. So then we're back to. I mean, my biggest concern is I I want to I, I want to make sure we keep the two issues together and not yes, let them absolutely. get apart from each other. So absolutely. the timing of it, it, you know, that's that's my only because I do think for the public it would be important for having both of those two things on the same agenda. So. Okay, so um, no further action, and I will um, go back to the drawing board. One other clarifying question. When do they intend to break ground? Uh, at this point, they are waiting. Um, they're still, the, the, they're supposed to hear from the, uh, about the tax credits um, any day now, actually, by the, before the end of the month, they'll hear in that first round. Obviously, if they get them, then they'll move forward. They want to move forward rather fast. So um, like in the spring, I mean, this that would be they would want to try to do it this construction season. If they don't get it in this round, there's another round, like in in late spring. Um, so I mean, that's a that's a significant part of their financing. And, and is there 
why I asked the question is, is there uh, anything dependent, uh, is the pace at which they proceed dependent on anything that the city might do in terms of the tip? Mm, um, I mean, assuming I, they don't back out altogether, but I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I think, um, I don't think so. Because yeah. that would just, just in terms of uh, um, which year do they start paying taxes? That would make a difference. Yeah, I mean, we, we, the language in here, there's standard language we use, which we usually say the next fiscal year or upon commencement and completion of the construction. So that's always kind of left depending on when the project comes online. Okay. So I just want to interject one thing. We're going to lose a quorum at 6.30. Okay. We're now 45 minutes on this first topic. Sorry. Okay. So I'm going to leave. Gonna I'm going to let you're going to lose a quorum at 6.30. So I just want to put that out there. Yeah. One quick question: Do we have any? Do we have any idea or any clue of what the fee structure is going to be for people getting into this assisted living place? Do we have any? Idea? Yeah, we all that that can be presented to people. He, I, I would I would have them come to the city council and make a presentation. It's a very impressive um, proposal they have, and the fees that they charge, and the the market rate versus even the market rate is relatively affordable. Um, so that that would I would bring them forward for all of that, yeah. right. for the for the full council. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, and we've done they've done a presentation and they've done multiple presentations. Okay. So I just want to try and move us. Okay, so I do sure have to go. Um, here who were not and I just want to note that Kareem is staffing this meeting because of the transition, but going forward, we'll have to figure out how that gets done with you know Mary. Thank you. Thank you. So the next agenda item is to vote on whether or not to recommend the ordinance. It is ordinance 3503.4 to rezone densely developed residential properties between Barrett Street and Bridge Road it would be rezoned from URB to URC to reflect current uses. It was referred on 12 6. So, just here to speak to. Yes, can you come forward and uh, go up to the podium and would you <coughs> identify yourself, uh, name, and where you live? This is this is the no. is this the Hampshire no. Heights area. No, this is this is no this is um, Hampshire. Yeah, sure. This is the Hampshire Heights area. Yeah. Yes. Just, just just Hampshire Heights is the right thing. So, no, are you here to speak to Hampshire Heights? Are you here to speak to Hampshire Heights? Is this Hampshire Heights or Lakeview Community? No, Lakeview Community is later on the agenda. Oh. Thank you. I, uh, Mr. Susco, are you here to speak to? Uh, no, These are also later. Too. Sorry, I moved to recognize Carolyn Mish. I'm going to uh, second. Call okay. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Susco, are you here to speak to uh, Carolyn Mish? Yes. Okay. properties which are um, some of the most dense um, um, neighborhoods or, or condominiums slash apartments in the city. And Urban Residential B, which is currently the zoning that um, in which these two properties um, are located, doesn't allow for multifamily at all. It's, it's not allowed. So basically the way the current zoning stands is as a policy statement that over time we would want to see these two projects be redeveloped into something that's consistent with the urban residential B zoning, which allows single, two, and three family dwellings. So the purpose of the zone change to urban residential C, which does allow multifamily, is to really is really more of a policy statement saying, this is an important part piece of our um, housing stock. We don't anticipate, we don't want to encourage um, that uh, down zoning or less density because these are important properties within the city. So. Converting it to urban residential C essentially makes it more conforming than the existing um, situation, and that's that's the, the bottom line. There wasn't an initiative, there wasn't a petition by the property owner. It was just sort of looking at all these different locations in the city and trying to make sure that our regulatory structure matches our policy. Yeah. Uh, where about uh, it's in 
very cheap to bridge roll. Right. So there's a map included, um, and, it, and um, basically there's um, bridge. The intersection of Bridge Road and Jackson Street is where Hampshire Heights is located. There's a map. So there's an entire um, yes at the bottom of the actual ordinance. So um, I can just show you on this if you want. Um, so the perimeter of this is Bridge Road here, Jackson Street, Jackson Street School is basically over here, but this is all Hampshire Heights, yep. and it acts as a halfway farm, so the entrance is actually on there. Yep. So there's a tiny finger that compares me. There's this entire, there are two property owners. One is the housing authority, and the other is Halfway um, Farms is managed by Sphere Management. I don't have the full LLC name of the property owner, but it's just those two entities. And, and where does the other proposed zone change to pick up here? Uh, up. Labor, yeah. Oh, it's much further down Bridge Road. Um, you know, up, up, I don't know, it is. half a mile, three quarters of a mile. Yeah, yeah. This, this is the, okay. this is just the Hampshire Heights and the um, Halfway Farms. Half uh, well, is, is the residential the you're going to be zoned everything like that? All of Barrett Street, where the single family homes are? No, 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 just these just, two properties. Just those properties, right. period. Right. Okay. So, right now, they must have gotten a special permit. Then no, to, they were uh, done before those. zoning. It was done before zoning. Yeah. Yes, it was, that's right. Yeah. One of them, Halfway may have had, there may have been a special permit at the time before the zoning changed. I don't know the history of the Halfway Farms, or, um, but, you know, the Hampshire Heights goes back to the, you know, before our current zoning for urban residential fees. So, um, it, they, there are pre-existing non-conforming um, uses on those parcels. So, um, this urban residential C allows multifamily, so it would then, we'd be then saying, this may be non-conforming in some other minor aspects, but at least from a use perspective, multifamily is allowed in urban residential C. You were mentioning tenders on that job, 72. That's right, one of the four zoning, I forgot that. Any other questions on this one? Seeing none, all in favor? But number six will be very quick. Uh, we could take six out of order so um, Carolyn can leave the meeting, and we've, we've been told this to be very quick. So, uh, vote to whether or not recommend to propose ordinance revision. And my understanding is this I will read this, maybe you can explain this to us. Uh, um, language change? There's a merger of two sections essentially in the um, ordinance. So. Um, we have two sections in the zoning ordinance. <coughs> One is called open space um, or cluster residential development, and the other which is called planned unit development. Um, <coughs> and they're almost identical. The difference currently is that in a planned unit development, there are some um, um, business uses allowed as part of a special permit application that someone could bring forward. Um, there's only been one planned unit development um, approved in the city, and that was um, the uh, country uh, the, the golf course condominium project in Leeds, um, which now I'm um, losing the name for it. But where the um, out, as when the golf course was built out with all the um, <coughs> Fairway condominiums, Fairway Village, thank you. Um, that was a planned unit development because the course itself is considered the commercial aspect of a commercial development. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this really merge, essentially would merge the concept of cluster. Basically the idea is to cluster the development no matter what it is, whether it's residential, commercial in one area, and permanently protect open space on the rest of the parcel. So instead of having two different sections, just um, have one and allow some modest amount, very um, a, a low percentage of um, commercial uses as part of a special permit application to the planning board. So it um, would also specify that those um, allowed would be um, um, 
retail and personal services not to exceed the lesser of 2% of total gross floor area of the cluster or 4,000 square feet. So very so modest you, amount of commercial. In a nutshell, just to pull it, why do you need the change? Because um, <coughs> there's, uh, it's just to simplify the ordinance. That's what there's, I no reason, Sorry. Okay. There's, there's no so reason to have two sections that basically say the same thing. Ex yeah. Except for the commercial part. Right, plan unit development has always allowed that. An open space cluster doesn't. So now it's just saying, okay, we're going to have one um, cluster development where in which you could, if you um, requested and you got approval, could have some small amount, up to 4,000 square feet of, of non-residential use. But right now, there's no there's no limit to to the commercial space <coughs> plan unit development. Um, it's supposed to be accessory. It's not specified as two percent or 4,000 square feet. But it's basically on an as as review basis. So if I come in with a special permit, I say I want to plunk down a medical office building and do residential. Planning board would say, Well, wait a second, this doesn't make sense in this neighborhood or what have you. It's all sort of open ended. But it still has to come before the board as it is right now, as yeah. it's written. Right, as as written and as proposed. Yeah. It still has to come to planning board. Is it more restrictive on the commercial end if you with this change? Um, yes, I would say so. Any other questions? Uh, Mish, uh, I've got a question here. Um, it seems as though the cluster development is adding some uh, provisions for um, commercial, but, the, it's, but since we're deleting No, it's really just a merger. Um, let me just pull it. I'm sorry I didn't bring the zoning ordinance. I mean, we really haven't had a planned unit development in, you know, well, whenever it was, 70s or whenever. Late 80s, I guess it was mid 80s. Um, so it's, it, the point of it is to merge the two sections, so we just have one section. Um, but. Right, but if we're adding, if, if what's going on here is in the open space residential development, you're adding the underlying portion that's the and retail or personal services not to exceed. That's, that means that we're here adding retail or personal services, right? But that's a carryover from what you could do in the planned unit development section. Okay. <laughs> uh, either way, this is a this is a, a little used portion of the of the code. Right. There's a certain there's a space. Uh, requirements was five acres? A minimum of, in, in, depending on the district, there's a minimum, a four acre minimum to start with. So you have to have a parcel that's at least four acres to even come forward for a cluster. In town, it's three acres, but in the suburban residential and rural residential districts, it's four acres. Any other questions? Is my question removed? Yeah, it was. So let's take a vote. All in favor of recommending, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Thank you. Thank you. I'll go back to the listed agenda to item number five on the agenda, which is to vote whether or not to recommend proposed ordinance revision as the Laker community. Uh, a competition of 10 registered voters uh, to revise the zoning map 350 3.4. That parcel 18C-003, that's 716 Bridge Road, be rezoned from rural residential to urban residential B. This was referred on the 6th of December. So now I, I, I'd like to recognize uh, <coughs> if you'll come up and identify yourself. And uh, Richard, Richard Jasky, 774 Bridge Road. Drainage of Pine Brook is what I'm concerned about on this. Sustainable Northampton is okay. I know this is a recommendation from them, but the growth upstream for the Laker community is not sustainable downstream. This is the focus of what I'm trying to portray here. I'm in the neighborhood. 
Stephen Suskell's my neighbor, David Cotton's my neighbor. We've lived there, all of us people, all of our lives. Flooding for David Cotton is getting horrendous on his property. It's flooding. David has pictures of it he brought before another uh, committee. Uh, Chris Frank, my neighbor, I've talked with Chris. Chris is using part of his land as an overflow for what's coming downstream from Pine Brook uh, as a result of later being developed back in the late 80s, early 90s. There's a choke point at the Big Y. That's something that's been there since the 60s. It's a major strategic situation. There's only so much room to let that volume of water through underneath the Big Y. It's not uh, any other, there's no other way for that water to go except flood up on top of the retention basin across from Seal Frank and then go right through the parking lot. That's a very, very important situation. Uh, Connie Bushy lives right there. Her house has been flooded several times over the years and a major flooding. Uh, and uh, my property, I own a heck of a lot of area along that brook. I'm losing my property. I'm it's eroding into this brook. Um, again, uh, we brought up the fact there's a high pressure gas line there that goes down half the street. Major supplier to the University of Massachusetts for their power plant. That's a that's a very very uh, that call that uh, pr high pressure gas line has been exposed. That road has uh, caved in. The culvert underneath the road is too small uh, to get the water underneath from David Cotton's property to the brook. So you've got an infrastructure situation right there uh, with a high pressure gas line plus a, uh, another gas line for residential use right there. Um, and I think a lot of this has to do with catastrophic rains. Um, you know, existing uh, culverts, as I just said. Uh, the roofs and the roads that are being used in construction of these very dense developments. Uh, sure, there are retention basins up there, and I understand they're engineers. I'm not an engineer. I didn't engineer them. I'm sure that they used calculations they thought was correct. But what's happening is the water is shedding off of these roofs, coming off of these roadways, filling these retention basins, and then it's just coming right over the top of the uh, little dams that they've got there and right down to the Pine Brook, which is the only way out of there. Um, bank erosion on my property is starting to become a pretty good concern of mine. I'm starting to lose some of my property, some of the stumps that were trees that have fallen over being undermined by the volume of water coming down from this area. And uh, frankly, I don't want to lose any more of my property. Uh, I've also had a concern uh, that was uh, brought to our attention in 1990. I've had to deal with the Conservation Commission back then on this. It was very much fun, and I don't want to deal with it anymore. I don't want to have my property in danger, and not just me. I respect my neighbors. I respect Steve, and I respect David. And I respect the other people that have property along, along this brook. So the thing I want to make sure that you people understand, though, I'm not against development. I'm not particularly uh, saying that I, I want all development stopped and, and everything else. But I do think that in this particular case, we've got a situation where the infrastructure we've got has been caught up to by the development that's happened upstream. And I think the city of Northampton has to look at this and has to address these issues before any more change is done in densifying that zoning. Because if you densify it, you're going to need more roofs to cover the buildings that are being built, and you're going to need more parking. And the, and the traffic situation on Bridge Road, it's a whole other issue. But uh, I'm just a citizen. I'm not an engineer. But I know what's happened because I've lived there all my life. And again, I'm not against everything. I'm, I'm just protecting my property. And uh, I'm trying to make a statement here to portray that as well as me. Thank you. Okay. Steve, would you like to? Yes. I won't say too much because I thought that was a great presentation by my neighbor. Uh, my name's Steve Susco, 754 Bridge Road, and I'm the second uh, location from the so-called point A of the Lathrop community's drainage. Uh, the first location being Dave Cotton. Uh, I've now been at my location for 60 years. Uh, and just
just to clear up a matter, we consider it, we consider the Lathrop community to be up Bridge Road and not down Bridge Road. Uh, the, oh, could I first say that uh, David Cotton, who's, he's trying valiantly to get here this evening, uh, he's on a, he has a major contracting job up in Vermont. He's trying to get an 85-ton crane off of uh, Haystack Mountain without anybody being injured. So he, was, he gave me a call. That was the call, and I apologize for the phone. And he said he'd be here within a half an hour. Uh, if he doesn't arrive, I, I would request through him that the meeting possibly be continued or uh, such that he could make an input. Uh, some of the reasons I'll just touch on lightly, uh, the change of the character of the area is something I've been concerned with for the last 25 years. And I think this is a continuation of it. I've heard that once this rezoning takes place, that we want to rezone everything in the watershed of Pine Brook. And uh, the funny thing is, as I go around the area, the watershed, I don't find anybody who's bought into that or was part of the decision. Uh, I think this rezoning, I still believe it's spot zoning essentially. Uh, I don't believe the uh, State uh, Zoning Enabling Act allows anything, and allows you to do anything you want, as Mr. Fryden indicated at the uh, City Council meeting. Uh, I think it's unfair to others how it's being done piecemeal. Uh, as Richard said, the real problem here is the urbanization of Pine Brook. And that includes all of the additions and the problems and the blunders and the things that have been overlooked. And that's not to lay blame with any particular party. Uh, it is a problem. I have a patio behind my house, concrete patio, that was placed there in 1953. Uh, for the first 40 or more years, the thing was stable. The undermining of the hill behind my house by a tributary to Pine Brook, which involves the drainage from the point A of the Lathrop community, which is the drainage uh, behind the uh, house on the land that's proposed to be rezoned, uh, the, and the, it, which flows through David Cotton's property across Hatfield Street into my property, is undermining my hill. It's already cost the city $25,000 two years ago to repair as it was undermining Hatfield Street also. And the city did go in there and do an emergency repair, but they didn't, they're not helping my situation because now we've moved the water into my slope. So now there's increasing uh, undermining there, and my 40-foot by 25-foot patio is now headed downhill. It's pulled away from the house about an inch, and it's not from any other situation going on there. Uh, so there is damage being caused to existing citizens. I've heard a lot of talk about the uh, Sustainable Northampton Plan essentially requiring this rezoning to take place. I find nothing in the plan, I, and I recently read it a number of times, uh, nothing indicates that uh, one group of citizens should pay the price for another citizen's rezoning. And I'd ask you to not allow that to take place. Right at the moment, the only thing that's mitigating this problem or preventing it from getting worse is the zoning of the area. I know that the Lakeford community at the last council meeting asked that uh, not to, that the city council shouldn't use zoning as a method of control. Well, that the only, the only thing that's uh, I, uh, preventing the situation from uh, getting out of control is the zone. So I'm asking, and I think my neighbors are asking you to, to maintain the status quo at the moment. Until we can figure out what it is we're going to do, 
with this drainage situation, and I, I give you a detailed description of the drainage situation, but it, it involves replacing culverts and, uh, and digging under the big Y strip mall in order to get the right size pipe. And I would recommend, I have offered to give tours. I know uh, Mr. Cotton has given Mr. Tacey a tour because uh, there's nothing like, this is a, a case where I think armchair counseling isn't good enough. You really need to go out and look at it. And I happened to go to the big Y on my way here, and I, I doubled back around back on Cook Avenue. I just wanted to look at that pipe. And you need to stand there and think of all that watershed, including its rezoning that's proposed. And every drop of water has got to go through that little tiny pipe. Uh, it's a blunder, uh, just to toot my own horn, when the big Y was redeveloped, I tried to get it, somebody interested, but no one wanted to be interested. So for all types of reasons, the bottom line is that we're asking you to maintain the status quo until we can address this situation as a city and figure out what it is we're gonna do about it. And I've already given my description of the 1955 hurricane and what it did in that area when there were no gas pipes, especially the 12 inch eye pressure one. And I won't, I won't bore you with that again, but it, that's what we're facing. We're, we're overdue for the 50 year storm right now. So, and it's, we're not gonna fix it very quickly. So we may have questions for both you and Richard too as counselors. Oh, thank you. I was going to propose we had some sort of a yeah. Let me just dialogue see. kind of yeah, thing. That might like, that might come about. Maybe okay. I'll, I'll try. I'll, I'll sit down. Yeah. But sit down right up front. Thank you. Do you have anything you want to ask before you go? I, I just uh, no. As much as I want to share, I'm confused about um, the. I understand the on the ground ramifications, and as a policy matter, I'm confused about the linkage of between zoning and an infrastructure gap. And I'm just confused about how to sort that out. Okay. Which is why I'm sorry I'm going to leave really, really, really slowly okay. and just eke yeah. out the last yeah. second of the conversation. As long as you're still here, you can vote, so. Yeah, yeah I don't think <laughs> they're going to vote quite <coughs> that good of work. Um, yes, yeah, I, I, and I've got some tools. Well, I've actually, I've toured a couple of times. Yeah. I'm very familiar with it all of my life. Um, the Behind David Cottage, there's a 24 million gallon retention basin. 24 million gallons, which is one and a half times the size of the Upper Roberts Meadow Reservoir. That they say if that burst, it would flood all of Leeds and would be enormous property damage. This is from GZA. He talked about the damage that would happen if that were to let go. It's tremendous. That's what they're telling us. So, this is a 20, and, and we have, and there's a floodplain below the Roberts Meadow Reservoir that is hundreds and hundreds of acres to absorb this water. So you're talking about sending 50% more water down through a little tiny brook between Bridge Road. This is a huge uh, amount of water. And it actually all drains down to a puddle, a puddle-sized retention basin, smaller than this room, behind what used to be Bickford's. Uh, and uh, there's a couple of real estate offices out there. And that drains into a six-foot diameter pipe that is actually underneath, underneath the building, the big wide building. There's a 12-inch, 600-pound, PSI gas main that was only not exposed by four feet of ground when the storm drain let go this past fall behind Steve Susco's house. It did expose a six inch gas main. Four feet beyond that is a 12 inch. Six. There's enough that we did the numbers and I actually called uh, Columbia. But Columbia Gas doesn't own it. I think it's Berkshire Gas that actually owns that gas main. There's enough gas in that main to fill, and it's heavy. The gas is heavy. There's enough gas in that main, should it fail, to fill the 30 
create acre site of big Y, big, lo uh, big lots and Walmart every four or five minutes. It's a lot of gas, it's enormous. So, so Council, you're saying there's a major problem. Absolutely, okay. and, so and, we and, and we are charged, and you with, with, with me also, yeah. along with Jesse Adams and, and Bill White and Brian, to try to figure out something to do with this storm system. And Richard's lot yard is falling into this brook. Stephen's yard is falling into this brook. I've been to Bushy's house to pump Bushy's house up, which is on Cook Avenue. All of this drains on it, not just once. This is a this is a, like an occurrence all the time. And I have to agree with uh, Mr. Susco that the savior here right now is that there is is the zoning does not allow any more de any any denser development than is there right now. And I'm familiar with the uh, storm system, and right now. On the same scale, it's happening at a reservoir road. And now we're trying to find out how we're going to control this flood water. And so rather than even do anything that could even possibly make it worse, before we have come up with some type of solution, which we have to ask the public to do, it just doesn't. I, I'm pro development. I, that's how I keep my living. I'm all pro development. Um, but this is not, um, this isn't right at this time. Until we can figure out what we're going to do with our storm system. Uh, okay. Now, I'll, I'll leave it go. It's, 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 it's a huge argument. I have some questions. I did not want to say that. Uh, I, I could feel it. It's just, it's just <laughs> vibration coming from all over this. Uh, I've really not said much during this. Uh, This is a this is a really good opportunity for the council and the board of public works to uh, to, to take a good look at our stormwater um, permits because uh, I I don't agree with Mr. Susco that the only thing stopping um, the situation from getting worse is the zone because there are also pretty much any project that happens of the scale that they just talked about will have to have storm. that we really want that 
that's hovering over us right now. I mean, we do, I think, I think we do, we would all appreciate the expansion of Lakewood community, uh, it's presuming it's done right, but because we have some time, I think that we should take the time. I'd like to direct this to the two of you. It seems to me quite clearly that, as you said, we don't know who, you know, it's not who we're going to blame here, but somebody didn't plan right in terms of what was going to happen with stormwater and runoff in this area, correct? And so my, what I'm hearing from the two of you is, don't go ahead and do this because look what's happened in the past. Why should we trust that going forward, it's going to be any better? So we've got a bad problem now. And now the same, you know, kind of the same process that was in place years ago is what you're saying. We can't trust that. So I'm going to ask you a hypothetical, which is, you know, just a hypothetical. It, because it is the responsibility of the planning board and other people to look at this and say, look, we're not going to let you build on here, Lake Group House, because you, you can't put in what's needed in terms of stormwater. So basically, I think I hear you guys saying, in a hypothetical, if I could give you some guarantee that people were gonna, the engineers were gonna do their job and say, look, if it's gonna make it worse, you can't approve this. Would you guys say, okay, like to go, you know, then go ahead and do this? My assumption is you'd probably say, yeah. I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I respectfully disagree with uh, one thing. I mean, <coughs> there's a linkage here between the zoning and, uh, and, and and this stormwater issue. That's There's a definite linkage. So if I was, Schwartz, if she was here, I would love to be able to explain that yeah. to her. Because we wouldn't be here if we couldn't, we, we're not trying to be a pain about this. But we're trying to, when they engineered that thing back in 1990, the um, the first thing that happened was that the retention basin was flooded there, came right down to Pine Grove. So, and that's where we ran into trouble with the Conservation Commission, all up and down that brook. Okay? So, you understand there's a mistrust, you're absolutely I, right. I now. totally, I totally understand. That this so comes from a history of it, it, it has to be looked at by the DPW. There's a serious infrastructure problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wait, uh, since I addressed both of them, Steve. No, go go ahead, Steve. Because okay. No, I just I just wanted to say that uh, it was misengineered the first time. So yeah, well, I'm always going to be skeptical, and I am an engineer, and I'm skeptical. Of that too. And also that the cost <laughs> right now, there, there are enough problems right now that as Councilor Tacey was pointing out, the and cost of the current problems. And I don't mean that right. they're doing it on purpose. Okay. Right here. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I want to bring up another point I missed on my little list here was that the Lakeshore community owns an additional 30 acres, which is which is already zoned URB. So they, by right, can develop that to the requirements of limitations of URB, and they obviously have to get a stormwater permit and whatever other permits. So that could be done, and, and, and the area of the land is on the north side of Pine Brook, so the drainage would probably end up going directly to Pine Brook, but not through David Cotton's property. So we, there, there is an opportunity there to expand the laser pond right now, if they were going to which I know isn't really their plan at the moment, uh, which would have a minimum impact on David Cotton and probably myself, but not Richard, or the Bushies or the Frank Company or the Big Y. So you, the trouble with this whole system is that there's problems all along it, and when you, but when you get to the end, that's where the worst situation is. So I just want to apologize, but we've never had an Edward Committee I have something I need to leave at 6.30. We'll lose our form. Okay. And I really apologize, as, as you saw at the beginning of this meeting, we're kind of doing this new by the sea. I didn't even know I'd be chair tonight until earlier in the day. So I apologize, we have 10 more minutes. Uh, Kevin, if we're making ahead. any progress or going anywhere, can we extend it? Uh, we certainly so we could do that, yeah. The, uh, what, what I was gonna add is that um, the Conservation Commission hasn't been involved since I've been involved here, so it's correct. May not have been fun years ago, but uh, hopefully we'll get a, a, a different. It's more fun system. now. Yeah, it's more fun now. <laughs> but the, uh, there, in other parts of town, there have been uh, uh, permits that have been applied for before us where the stormwater work has been properly calculated uh, given the technical requirements, but has ignored um, the uh, in 
may capability of the downstream um, terrain to handle the flow. Um, and so to, similar to Owen's comment about well, does not making it worse apply when the situation was already bad? And in fact, um, we've gone into some of those and uh, when the permit uh, process before us uh, looks clear to us that this is going to have some negative impacts, even though it may technically be uh, adequate um, in terms of peak flows and so forth, um, that we've uh, um, warned people that when we come back for the final approval, we're going to have to see that from here till it gets in the river, the Connecticut River, which is essentially around here where everything has to end up, uh, we're going to want to see that it doesn't create downstream problems even though it may technically not be required by the stormwater permitting process, we've wanted to see that because it can do damage to other environmental concerns that we are responsible for. Yeah, can I just ask that a question? If, uh, you're not a voting member of this committee, right. but if you were, can I ask you where you would stand? Uh, I, in general terms, I uh, would think that uh, it's wise for the city to uh, look at the implications of a zoning change. Allow denser development that is going to have additional roof, additional impermeable surface, um, and that that's therefore going to have some impact, and that should be uh, considered. Is is the system that's available adequate for that before the zoning is deemed to be appropriate? Okay. So I have one other question, and I guess the senior most member here at the council I should have the answer. But is there some way for us to, as as a council down the road, write that in? No building can take place. Is there, I, I haven't seen this is a unique situation. I've never seen that happen. I'm not sure if we could do something like that and say, because again, back to, uh, uh, and I understand this. It's like there were mistakes made, and this is this, and so I understand your lack of trust moving forward. And I wonder if there's, and I think that's what you're saying too. Wait, I'm not going to rezone this unless there's some guarantee. I, I, there has to be some other input. I'm not sure we have the authority to write that in. Yes, see. So that may, I don't. I don't think you have the authority, but that's just the layman's opinion. But uh, going in the same vein, if you rezone it, and the Lathrop community has said, "Well, then we have the uh, an impetus to have an engineer study the drainage situation." If they then decide that for it, for their purposes it's too expensive or whatever, or can't be done, this land is now rezoned forever in perpetuity. And you can't prevent that. So now the Lathrop home can sell that to a developer who can develop it to the max and do what exactly what we're trying to prevent. Well, not if not at the same reason. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. But go ahead. So I think I, the, the the issue is I, I think the issue is can the city have a permitting process for development, particularly around stormwater, that's different from what it currently has. Perhaps is more holistic, perhaps is more global, or perhaps is uh, takes a smaller grain. Um, for instance, I, I, I mentioned this to Director Huntley uh, last week, and um, or maybe maybe actually now a month ago, um, and he said that basically their permit it had triggered until until the project gets to a certain size, and that's in, it's in keeping with the state requirements and so on. But I wonder, and I and I also do not know, but I don't think it's wise to proceed without knowing this sort of thing. So if, if we can change how the city does stormwater permitting. So I really think we should. I, I think this is more of a Board of Public Works conference committee issue. Yeah, we will bring that up. It, it, but the I would recommend, uh, and I, I don't see, I agree with, is it okay if I speak? Yeah, yeah absolutely. That, yeah. that um, I don't see the rush on this, the Laker House. And I'm a little confused because on the one hand, there's no, no building going on. On the other hand, there's this, there is, as we all felt, there's this pressure to get it, get this done. And so what I would recommend, because I'd like to find out some answers of what power I, I with uh, Mr. Susco, I, I don't think we have the power to do that, but I'd like to look at what kind of power do we have, number one. I'd like to have this come up in the Joint Conference Committee, which was not on the agenda yesterday, and do that. So I'd be happy to just uh, continue this, which means that it hasn't, we're not moving out of committee yet. So. Yes. In just in the same vein, uh, Mr. Fyden misled the council uh, when he was asked, uh, "Did the Lathrop, <coughs> was the Lathrop community rezoning dependent on a design in 1990 or 88, whenever it was?" And it actually was. There was a design for the Lathrop community that was.
was considered as part of the rezoning in terms of density and placement and road and curb cuts and drainage okay. at the time. So, and here we're doing it blindly. We really don't know where. There we sort of knew where we were going to end up. We didn't know what the, what, how it would evolve and what the problems would be, but here we're so not even not doing that. Be only because I, I, I hope we need postpone this until next meeting. Okay, so it, did I have yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. And, and hopefully we can uh, hear from the Department of Public Works at that time. Yeah, we should invite them to come. And that's important because we talked about it, as Kevin was saying, before I yield, I was going to get into an engineer will design, will handle the stormwater on that particular site and not really care. I mean, we saw fairgrounds. We can see it everywhere. That's one of the examples I was thinking. It's constant. I, I, I talked to engineers. Because engineers, designers, will come up with a plan, and it's a, it, it's a matter of convenience to the engineer as to what he's going to put together. I mean, I go through this all the time with plans. The engineers always tell you that the first thing that you do on your site is you control the water. That's the first thing that you do. The water surrounding the site, you need to control that water before you do anything, before you turn any dirt or anything. <coughs> so I thought the phases were backwards on the fairgrounds. The storm water should have been handled around yeah. the fairgrounds before the fairgrounds had, because they put these huge underwater, underground uh, basins right. and things. off color. Yeah, I know, but, I'm serious, but, but that's what happens with the engineers. No, it's really not off color. Oh. Engineering is, will so, Go ahead. So I, I, I think so we're going to postpone. We're going to postpone this. Uh, we'll we meet again. I believe it's we where are we meeting the first week in. Uh, it's up to the chair. February. I will let you know. Yeah, we can until we sell on schedule. I think. Yeah. So thank, thank you. I'm sorry much. we have to cut this short, but in some ways I think it's good. We're slowing this process down. It won't come. It won't move anywhere until it gets out. I of hear you listening. <laughs> You're here, I appreciate it. I'll have You're you. welcome. Any new business? Entertain the motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. <laughs>